Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, God's door is always open for you. God's door is always open. You can always find your way back to God. You can always find your way back into fellowship with God. You know, and in the Bible, there's a story about a young man that we know the story as the prodigal son, that he'd wandered away from the father only to be restored to a beautiful place of honor. You know, God doesn't put that story in there to try to scare you and try to keep you in line of what happens if you wander away from God. But for you to have hope and know that we have the kind of father whose arms are always open and you are always welcome to come back home. Amen? So let me dive into this story a little bit. Uh, the story is about a father who has two sons. And it says that the younger son had come to the father and he wanted his inheritance. Basically, what he's saying is, look, I, I don't even care if you drop dead right now. I want the money. There are some things I want to go do with my life. And, you know, the father obliged and gave him the money. And the Bible tells us that that son went away. He went away to a distant, a distant country where he blew it all. He blew all the money on prostitutes, on booze. And the Bible says he blew it all on unrighteous living. And the Bible tells us that at the end, as he's flat broke, he hired himself out to a pig farmer. Now, how many of you know if you're a Jewish boy where, you, where pigs are considered an unclean animal, you've definitely reached rock bottom when you hire yourself out to a pig farmer, right? And listen to what it says. After he had spent everything and there was a, se a severe famine in the whole country, he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to the fields to feed the pig. As he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Would you read the underlines with me, starting in verse 17? It says, when he came to his senses. Would you say that again? When he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out. I will go back to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. Verse 20. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him. Would you read it with me? His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, would you read this with me? Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Would you say that with me? They began to celebrate. You know, if you've, if you've ever been in that place where if you've wandered from God and you've made a big old mess of your life, where you've kind of taken a momentary leave from your senses, and you've made some decisions, and you're experiencing kind of the calamity of that. I want you to understand something, that you have a father who loves you. He is waiting for you to just turn your heart back to him, and he's there ready to embrace you and welcome you back into his family. Amen? God's door is always open. Turn to the person next to you and say it again. God's door is always open. So I want to talk with you about this today that kind of helps us under, unpack some things about this story. And the first thing, if you've got your outline, go ahead and fill in the blank here, is that initially when you read the story, his motives, and sometimes ours as well, your motives may not be perfect yet, but come back anyway. So you, when you're reading this story, the thing you discover is this, initially... It doesn't say that, he's, that his heart is broken because he knows that he's grieved or he's hurt the heart of the father. Initially, what is it that causes him to come to his senses 
and realize I need to make a change in my life? What was, what was the thing that caused him to do that initially? What was it? Yeah, he's hungry and he's broke. And so he recognized my life isn't working. I'm in a place of pain and I need to make a change. And so initially his motives may not have been the best but yet those motives worked to at least change the direction of his life. At rock bottom, he came to his senses. How many of you know rock bottom is a powerful teacher? Pain has a way of kind of getting your attention and helping you realize, man, what I'm doing is not working. And so wherever you're at right now, you may not recognize today how the decisions of your life have hurt the heart of the Father and it was his love that motivated him to come. You will come to that place, but initially, you may just be thinking, I'm hungry, I'm broke, my life isn't working, I need to make a change. Whatever the reason, just start making the change. Amen? Turn your heart to the Father. And the next thing we learn from him is that we got to be willing to take ownership for the decisions that we've made. Right? you got to take ownership for your situation. Now, as long as the place that you're in, the pain that you're in is always the fault of somebody else, you're just going to stay stuck in your brokenness, right? Amen? As long as it's always somebody's, somebody else's fault. And you know, he, he took responsibility for the place he was in. He didn't say, well, this is my dad's fault. He should have gave me more money, right? Or he didn't say, this is all my dad's fault. He should have known I wasn't ready for it. He shouldn't have given it to me. He should have just made me stay home. Why does everything bad happen to me? No, he recognized that the place he was in was the result of his own decisions. And guys, that's true of every one of us. We are the result of the decisions we make. We are where we are today because of the decisions we may have made yesterday. Amen? Now, granted, not every decision we make is sinful ones. Sometimes we just made some stupid ones. How many of you made dumb choices? They weren't sin, but they were just dumb. Anybody? Okay, I could probably raise both hands and both feet for that one. But, you know, then, then there are some decisions that we make. They are just flat-out sinful decisions. We make decisions to sin. And he says when we make decisions to sin, we miss out on the Father's blessing on our lives, and life will not work. And when life is not working, we can't turn around and play the blame game and say it's because of this person, that person, or it's somebody else's fault. It's always the result of the decisions I make. Sometimes we are victims and things happen in our lives, okay, that shouldn't have happened. And yet at the end of the day, there's still decisions we have the power to make in response to those things that have happened to us. Does that make sense what I'm talking about? And so the decisions are always ours. And, you know, it's kind of interesting in this story is that he takes ownership for it. And he doesn't just say things like, you know, I really made some uh, poor decisions in my life. He doesn't say, you know, I really goofed. He actually gave his decisions a name. He called them out. Did you hear it when I was reading it? What did he call those decisions? He called them sin. He didn't just kind of whitewash it and say, boy, I really made some mistakes. He recognized that he said, I have sinned. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you, my father. And so it's important that if we're ever going to leave the pig pen behind, at some point we've got to recognize it was my sin that put me there in the first place. Can anybody say amen to that? Now here's the next thing we learn from this son, is that once you've come to that realization, you've got to make a decision to put as much distance between you and the pig pen, you and your past life, you and that old life, you've got to turn and put distance between you and that old life, right? So go ahead and fill that in. Is put as much space as possible between you and your past. So what does this story say? 
it says that he rose up and he went to his father. He turned. He decided, I've had enough of the pig pen. I've had enough of the pig slop. And so he made a decision to get up, turn his back on the pig pen, and begin to be restored into relationship with the father. Now, I love what they say in baseball. They say, you cannot steal second with your foot still on first. Think about that for a moment. You can never get to second base as long as you're still standing on first. And this is what I've discovered with a lot of folks. is They, they, they want to be in right relationship with the father, but they want to wallow in the pig pen too. And how many of you know you can't have one with the other? And at some point, we, like this son, need to recognize I'm in this place because of decisions that I've made, and I'm not happy with that. And so I'm now going to rise up. I'm going to turn away from the old life, and I'm going to move towards the Father, begin to be restored into relationship with the Father. So if you want to come home, then I want to challenge you that perhaps today is the day for you to finally make the decision to not just raise your hand and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, but to actually turn your back on the old life and begin to walk towards the Father. You know, the Bible uses a word for that. You guys know what the word is? It's the word repent. Okay? Do you guys know what repent means? Repent means to turn. It means I'm going this way, and now I'm repenting. I'm changing the direction of my life. I was heading that way towards a pig pen, but now I've turned, and now I'm going towards the Father. And so today may be the day for some of you to move beyond the superficial, raise my hand, Jesus, I'm sorry, I've sinned, to actually turning away from that old life and moving towards the Father. And you know, there's something else that we discover in this story, and I want to challenge you that we allow God's grace to lead us to a place of humility and to worship. So here's what happened. The prodigal, he arrives home, and he begins to speak these words that he was rehearsing. Because he told himself, I know what I'll do. I'll go home, and I'll tell my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. He had been rehearsing this speech all the way home. And when he gets there, something radical happens. He begins to uncork and give this, you know, rehearsed message to the father. And the father stops him. The, the father stops him right there. And he does an amazing thing. He calls for a celebration. It says he calls to his servant. He says, quick, go get a robe and let's put it on his back. Go get a ring and put it on his finger and sandals. Let's put that on his feet. And then it says, kill the fattest, fat, fatted calf and let's feast. Let's celebrate. For this son of mine that was dead is now alive again. This son of mine that was lost is now found. Talk about a radical turnaround. Now, there's some words that we throw around church quite often that we really don't understand that much about. Now, this story gives us some insight uh, on radical forgiveness, right? It gives us insight on radical reconciliation. We can look at that story and say, boy, this is really a portrait of the outrageous love of God. Wouldn't you agree with me? But I want to take a look at two other words briefly that this story paints such a beautiful picture of. It's the word mercy, and it's the word grace. Let me talk with you. Let me unpack those words just a little bit. So when he comes home, what would you possibly expect from a father whose son had blown everything, maybe even kind of disgraced the name of the family a little bit through the way he was living? You'd maybe expect a father with his, with his arms crossed, maybe his foot tapping like this. Maybe a father with a scowl on his face and a furrowed eyebrow. 
Maybe you would expect a long, lengthy lecture. Or maybe a tirade. Uncork and yell at this son. You would expect those kind of actions, wouldn't you? And yet none of that happened. And that, my friend, is what mercy is. It's when somebody deserves all of this, but he doesn't get what he deserves. What he should get, he didn't get. And that is a portrait of mercy. How many of you know because of our sin, we do deserve to be separated from God? We deserve everything we get. And yet we don't get it because of God's mercy. When we come to him, he's not lecturing us. He's not pointing a finger at us. He's not belittling us. He's not angry with us. He doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. But on the flip side, he gives us what we did not deserve. Did this son deserve a robe? Did he deserve a ring on his finger or sandals on his feet? Did he deserve that there would be a celebration? Did this son deserve to be promoted to a place of honor and celebration? Did he deserve at that moment to be immediately restored to the place of sonship? Did he deserve that? He didn't deserve it, but he got it all. He got what he did not deserve. That is grace. That is grace, my friend. And you know, this story is in the Bible because he wants you and I to understand this is the heart of our Father. No matter how far you've wandered from God, no matter what's led you to that place, no matter what deep hole you may have dug for yourself, regardless of what dark place you may be in. The moment you come to your senses and realize, I don't like this place that I'm in anymore. And the moment you rise up and begin to turn to your father, he's already there. He's already meeting you right there, giving you mercy and pouring out his grace. Not giving us what we should have, but instead giving us what we did not deserve. That's the kind of father that we have, and I think we ought to give him a rousing applause for that. Amen? Now, the last thing I want to point out in this story... Oh, actually, I want to read a couple of verses to you. Can I do that? These are powerful. One is in Psalms, and the other one's in Ephesians. It says this, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. What word would describe that? The word that I just gave you. Mercy. Instead, let me read this. He is rich in kindness and in grace. He purchased our freedom with the blood of his son, and he forgave us. What is that? That's his grace. Now, let me wrap up by saying something that we learn about the heart of God. Which, by the way, if you didn't catch it, this story is really a story about the heart of the Father that we worship. The heart of God that we say we love. This is his heart towards us. And that you need to know that your father is waiting and your father is watching. Amen? Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, your father is waiting and your father is watching. While he was still a long ways off, his father was filled with compassion. He ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, I don't have necessarily personal stories of, of this being really played out other than one that doesn't even come close. But, you know, my daughter here, which I just love her so much, and she spent six years living in California, and we missed her. We missed her a lot. Many of you missed her too, right? True. And we didn't get to see her but just a couple of times a year. And during that same period of time, our son was off in California going to Bible college for four years. And boy, we sure missed him too because we love our kids deeply. 
And, you know, when they were coming home, whether it was maybe summer break uh, or coming home for Christmas break, whatever it was, we were excited. We were excited to be at the airport. And, you know, since 9-11, you can't go to the gates anymore to greet people. And so you're kind of relegated to an area they call the meet and greet. How many of you have been to the meet and greet? Right? And so you're there. And, I mean, you can look past security uh, into the terminal area, and you can see people coming. And the whole time, you're not looking at everybody else. You're like, do you see her? Can you see her yet? Do you see Joey yet? Are they coming? Do you see her? And your eyes are just looking and waiting. And the moment you can look way down the terminal, you go, there she is. She's coming. And there's something inside of me that says, man, I wonder if I can just crash through security and go get to her. I'm so excited. Well, let me tell you, that wouldn't be a very good visit if I had to visit her and I was behind bars, right? That's what they do to you if you go crashing through security. And so we, we had to kind of stay put. But man, I'm telling you, we're fidgeting. We're excited. And, the, and you get as close as you can right there. And the moment they're through, it's always a big hug. It's always a big kiss. And it's always, welcome home. We love you. We missed you. And can I tell you, that, that is just such a small fraction. That is such a small fraction of how our Father feels toward you. You know, the Bible says something amazing. It says that there is a party thrown in heaven for just one lost son or daughter that comes home. One sinner, one person that's been stuck in the pig pen. When just even one comes home, heaven calls for a party. And you know, this morning at our 9 a.m. service, heaven was partying because there were a lot of people they got right with God today. Amen? Have you ever thought of God as having emotion? Or do you feel like maybe he's a little void of emotion? Let me read a verse to you. It is so rich in emotion. It says, the Lord your God is with you. He's mighty to save. He will take great delight in in you. He will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. I want you to know something that today your father, he's watching, he's waiting. He wants you home. You can come home again. Amen. You can come home again. Now initially that decision may not be have the most pure motives. It might be because you're sick and tired of being in pain, being broke, being hungry, being addicted. That might be your initial motive, but that's okay. Allow the pain to serve a purpose in your life that at least causes you to begin to look up and begin to change the course of your life. And then like that prodigal son, it's time to rise up take personal ownership. I'm in this place because of me. I'm going to stop playing the blame game. And now I'm going, I'm going to call it what it is. It's sin. I'm now going to rise up and I'm going to turn to my father. And then this is where he tells the narrative right back where he says, the moment you do that, I will already be pouring out mercy and grace on you. I will already be restoring you to a place of sonship. You are not relegated to this place of my servant. You are my son. You are my daughter. And so I want you to rejoice in the amazing grace and mercy of God. We must know this, that he has already been watching and waiting for you. And the moment you do that, he's already there, ready to wrap his arms around you and kiss you and tell you, welcome home. I have been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. And so I'm going to ask if we could bow our heads together this morning. And this may be in your story where it starts to get really good. Because God's not done writing your story.